Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, the uh, second webinar on business continuity, where we're going to focus on some business management aspects. And this is, of course, part of the series of webinars that we've been running through this lockdown phase to try and help the community and our clients through this whole COVID-19 situation. Now, my name is Dave Newick. I am the Managing Director here, and many of you will be uh, familiar with me, and I'm familiar with you, so uh, welcome again if you are uh, new to, uh, to the webinars especially, but also those who are uh, repeat customers, shall we say. Now, I'm joined today by uh, a couple of very important people, and in the background, firstly, and you won't hear from her, is our Customer Success Manager, Jessica Furbank, so she's going to be uh, running the webinar for us, so welcome to you, Jessica. And you're going to hear from uh, Pippa Shepherd with her dulcet Midland tones. So good morning to you, Pippa. Uh, morning, Dave. And of course, we're going to hear from Samantha Warner. Samantha uh, has a hybrid Kiwi and English accent, but we're in a webinar, so she's probably got her posh voice on. So good morning to you, Samantha. Good morning, Dave. Right, look, just a couple of bits of housekeeping before we start. So uh, you'll see a panel up in the right-hand side of the webinar, and that's for you to uh, be able to control and manage the, the way the webinar works. We actively uh, encourage participation, so there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, that's the bottom uh, section of that panel there. Now, a uh, couple of other things to bear in mind, and that is that we are broadcasting to you from four different locations. So please excuse us if we get uh, delivery trucks, uh, delivery drivers, teenagers asking for food, dogs barking. Um, or what we had last week was uh, my neighbour working on the brakes of his car or the, uh, the lawnmowers arriving to do the lawn. So uh, please excuse us. I guess we're getting uh, very good at doing that, aren't we? A couple of things to uh, think about as we start to get into this webinar. So if we could go to the, the summary slide there outlining what we're going to cover. So this is the, the area. Now you're going to hear from all three of us, that's myself and uh, Sam and, and Pippa. I'm going to cover off the business management piece where we're going to explore some pieces around uh, where we're at at the moment and where we might be heading. I'm also going to talk there about some leadership and some strategy aspects. And then Pippa's going to cover off uh, some staff management aspects as well. And uh, then Sam is going to come in and talk about the legal update in terms of where we're at in that regard, particularly referencing things like uh, signatures and how we go about executing. And then I'll come back in for the summary uh, towards the end there. So we expect that the webinar will run for around about 60 minutes or so, uh, but we certainly hope, and I say this all the time, but often we run right up against the clock uh, but we certainly hope to have the time to take any of your questions. So uh, do feel free to, uh, to get involved. The one last thing just to, to signpost for you is that uh, at the end of the webinar, there's going to be the opportunity for you to, uh, to get involved and to give us some feedback. So uh, that's an automated email that, that comes out. And we'd really appreciate anything that you could tell us, good, bad or otherwise, about uh, this webinar and or any other webinars and particularly any ideas you've got of things that you would like us to uh, to talk to you about and to prepare a webinar on. So uh, anything you can tell us there would be would be fantastic. Now let's have a think about where we're heading with this in terms of uh, our overarching business management situation. Now there's a lot going on isn't there and uh, we're going to talk about some of those market conditions and uh, where we're at now that things are starting to settle a little at least. Uh, as I say we're going to talk about the leadership strategies and financial management pieces. Uh, there is actually a, a full webinar on financial management so I'm not going to delve into that uh, too deeply but I'll I do urge you if you're interested in that particular component to uh, look on our website because there is a great um, a great webinar there and uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the government help that's available and uh, a quick look over the top of some of the uh, do's and don'ts of, of, of marketing, a couple of golden rules there. So we anticipate this section will take uh, probably about 20 to, to 25 minutes. So let's kick off with market conditions shall we. Now it's interesting isn't it, you know, um, we're 
not quite in unprecedented times, although that's a term that is um, bandied around. Of course, you know, the world has been here before with the Spanish flu back in 1918, but uh, the, the world was a very different place then. And uh, the situation that we're in now is um, uh, very different for uh, any of us, I think, because anything that's similar like SARS or some of the other bird flu uh, epidemics have been uh, not quite global in their, uh, in their impact. Now I'm telling you things that, uh, that you already know there, but to, to, to set the scene, this section really is about uh, where we are actually at, because it's really important to understand that from a business management perspective, as we start to get to grips with uh, the things that we need to be thinking about now, as we start to look forward to prepare our businesses for the future and what we think is, is going to, to, to be coming. Now, uh, it's interesting again, isn't it? Because uh, when you do a lot of reading, and I've, I've been doing a lot of reading uh, in and around the different economic phases and some of the things that we anticipate uh, happening, then there's, there's uh, one certain truth, and that is that nobody is absolutely certain. So there is a, a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of conjecture uh, and interpretation of data and, and around the science. Uh, that's to do with the uh, COVID pandemic itself. But that also then extends out, of course, because it's inextricably linked with the way that the pandemic is managed to the uh, economy and to the, uh, to the impact of this lockdown phase on businesses and, uh, and economies at large. And so there's a whole lot of movement, there's a whole lot of change, there's a whole lot that, uh, that we don't know. However, if you do uh, jump on to, to Google and you were to, to search uh, economic phases post-COVID, uh, post you will see uh, a whole range of different articles. And if you scrape through these sort of special interest groups where we're um, uh, looking ahead and, and seeing that there's going to be some uh, pretty substantial changes going forward uh, and, and that they're pushing their particular um, uh, agenda in and around that, and I'm not knocking any of them, good on them for doing it, but there's a lot of discussion around electrical vehicles, for example, um, or uh, autonomous vehicles. There's, there's a lot of that happening. But what we do find is that generally, and I do say generally, these uh, are the typical phases that you would expect to have happen going out from here. So we're going to see some sort of relaxation of, of the lockdown uh, eventually, and generally that's going to be triggered by uh, the, uh, the change in um, getting over the number of people who are hospitalised, which of course, as we all know, is the reason that we're here. And the question in my mind from a business standpoint is, uh, what does that relaxation look like? So how can we uh, sit back and do our reading and do our research and start to think about uh, what uh, opportunities will be there and how we're going to run our businesses at that stage? I would anticipate that uh, there's lots of different options. And as I say, the data is, uh, is not exactly certain, but there's uh, different schools of thought. There's uh, perhaps the, the thought that young people who uh, have a very low mortality rate, I think it's uh, the highest rate for people less than 30 without health conditions is 0.15% uh, mortality rate. Uh, perhaps they will be uh, released from lockdown sooner. Uh, perhaps there'll be staged lockdowns. And if you look at New Zealand as an, uh, as an economy and the way that they've managed this, uh, the, 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 the two phases are absolutely inextricably linked, or rather the four phases are inextricably linked um, with the health system and the economy. And what New Zealand's done is they've gone from stage four and they're going now to stage three, where there's a graduated release of things that the public is allowed to do to try and ensure and control that the um, uh, the impact of release doesn't result in a whole lot more cases. Just a, a, a slight tangential point on that. And look, this is unproven, um, I must admit that I saw it on social media, but it, it must have some, uh, some validity. The, uh, the interesting thing about the Spanish flu is that in, uh, it actually arrived in 2017, but uh, the, the worst cases were in 2018 because of the seasonal effect of winter. And so uh, countries all around the world went into lockdown. But then, of course, that coincided with uh, the First World War going on. And then the First World War ended in uh, November 2018. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this figure, what had happened was that everyone flooded out into the streets 
uh, from lockdown uh, to celebrate the end of the First World War. And in fact, the, uh, the close uh, the relaxation of, of, of social distancing, the, the close contact that everybody had uh, with one another uh, eventually um, uh, resulted in a, a massive upward spike in deaths from uh, the Spanish flu. In fact, uh, this is the unproven, but which, which uh, I, I would have preferred to have checked before mentioning it. But uh, as, a, as a point, it's, it's, it is relevant. In fact, the number that were killed uh, as a result of that um, relaxation of the social distancing piece exceeded all those who were killed in World War I. Now, clearly, we don't want that. So coming back to the point about business management, the, the, the first phase is going to be that there's going to be some relaxation. Now, in an interstate uh, planning uh, area, that may well be that uh, we are able to uh, see people with some social distancing face-to-face, uh, -face, but perhaps not. Perhaps uh, that isn't the case, but we should allow for that in our planning as a, uh, as a potential activity. Of course, the other thing to consider about that is whether people would want to be seen face to face, uh, particularly if you're servicing older clients, they may well be very, very risk averse and we're going to be talking about that uh, a little bit in uh, a couple of minutes. Now, the next phase will be really resumption of economic activity, but it will be another R word on a reduced basis. And, um, you know, clearly the, the economy is going to take a uh, pretty significant hit. Uh, and so resumption of economic activity is going to be pretty important. So that will be uh, a separate phase to the relaxation of the lockdown. I don't think that we'll start seeing uh, that really happen until a month or two uh, after the relaxation because we've got to allow for the economic activity to start to, uh, to flow through. But you can start to think that businesses will um, go back to working. So for ourselves, when we start to think about uh, our business management, and I know that personally as a leader, I'm starting to think about uh, how we will manage the, uh, the resumption of uh, our activity within our own business. Does that mean that we have social distancing at work for a while? Does that mean that our, uh, everybody is working on different days? Do we come in and have uh, five people in on a Monday, uh, five people in on a Tuesday? I'm really not sure. Obviously, we've got to be led by government in these things. The point I make is that uh, as a phase, it would be good uh, from a business management perspective if we can build uh, that into our thinking and into our plans. Now, a phase, and look, this is the more difficult one to try and, uh, and pick, is, is renewal through government stimulus. Now, uh, there's lots of discussion in and around this, and clearly, if you look at different um, economic cycles, and perhaps if we just go back to the, uh, the most recent uh, recession, then uh, there's a lot of government stimulus in and around. Sorry, that was the delivery driver outside with his uh, stereo running. There you go, that's the first interruption of the day. If we look at the last recession, then uh, you see that there was a lot of um, uh, policy designed to encourage uh, activity. And uh, a lot of that was quantitative easing and uh, there was a whole lot of programs. And we've seen that uh, certainly here that the Chancellor has, uh, uh, I think, come up with some really good um, economic stimulus uh, package, and we could expect to see more of that as things start to um, uh, as things start to evolve. Uh, once we've got an idea as to the actual impact on GDP, the actual impact of uh, uh, the relaxation of lockdown the resumption phases, then uh, we could expect that uh, there will be more coming. Perhaps there's going to be some um, encouragement in and around uh, some very large projects, because one of the things that could happen is that uh, they could go all Keynesian on us and start to uh, invest in some very large uh, activities. One of those things, obviously, if you look at it now, it's brilliant, uh, that there's a lot of work going on on motorways and uh, and railways. Uh, and, and I would expect that we would see more of that uh, from government. So those broadly are the phases. Now, if we think about the conditions, though, that we're in uh, now, that we can expect to see all the way through, uh, the, the phrase that was used in the McKinsey report, which is down the bottom there, um, so please uh, take, a, take a shot of that if you like, it's an excellent report, um, was volatile and dynamic. And I think that's really uh, an appropriate description because there's a whole lot we don't know. And uh, there's a whole lot of scaremongering, of course, as well, by the press who are having an absolute field day with this. Uh, but there is a whole lot that we don't know. And we know that there's going to be a lot of change. And we do know that 
there is going to be some impact on GDP, uh, particularly in the short term, and uh, we need to keep our eyes open for the way in which uh, that rebounds uh, it from quarter to quarter. But ultimately, these things are things that we can't influence and control. They're going to happen. Uh, really, it's about trying to make sure that we can control our world rather than uh, trying to control the world. Now, one thing to, to bear in mind, and in, in, uh, in all the reports that I've read, the, uh, the, the uh, writers, the authors of those reports were, were pretty clear that the um, discretionary income of consumers is going to be reduced. And there's going to be all sorts of impacts of that, and I thought a really fascinating one was that 95% of cars in the UK are purchased style on finance, and uh, the majority of that is actually on a PCP plan. Now, that uh, entire um, system is predicated on an active second-hand market. If uh, people are unable to continue payments because they have no income, then that second-hand market for cars would start to collapse. And we can use that as an example, and we'll see that happening all the way through, I think, uh, the, the economy. And we can start to see that, particularly within the estate planning world, that that is something that we need to consider when we come to, uh, to do our planning. So will wills be something that our consumers are more concerned about or less concerned about? Um, here's another example for you. The housing market. Now, conveyancing is obviously uh, something that many of you firms will be doing, and uh, that's uh, been adversely affected already. We can expect that that would be, uh, be the case. But uh, in reports that I've read, then uh, there's also going to be some positive things because you're going to find that there's going to be, uh, I believe, a mini baby boom uh, coming up, and um, people will need bigger houses. I think you'll probably find that there's an equal and opposite effect, and that is that uh, people will be reconsidering their situations when they're living in large houses and will be looking to downsize. Perhaps they'll be looking to get rid of debt. Perhaps they'll be looking to uh, help family out by uh, realizing some of the equity that they have in their in their large properties, particularly old appearance and things like that. So th there will be a change. And uh, I think that there's going to be a change in terms of the intergenerational um, uh, connectedness and uh, that will all have a, a, a bearing on consumer discretionary income. So lots of moving parts there. And I use a couple of examples there because I'm not actually too sure exactly of how this will affect uh, estate planning. And I don't think any of us are. The point that I'm making is that we need to be ready for, uh, for the market circumstances being volatile and, uh, and dynamic. Now, I think that risk and legacy are going to become an important driver going forward. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, as uh, consumers, that as a result of this process, people are going to be quite changed. And uh, again, in all the reading that I've done, there's there's a lot of discussion around that that we're not going back to the world that we that we knew. And um, uh, I think that will be very true, and will find its way through to estate planning because uh, when uh, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to hear stories about. Uh, different people in my um, in my friendship group and in my wider community who have been adversely affected by COVID, and so it's starting to become very real. And if that's an indication of the situation that most of uh, the consumers are in, then people will be much more aware of their mortality, and uh, they'll be much more aware too of legacy, of the importance of managing their affairs so that uh, they can assist the young people. Uh, with that be sons, daughters, granddaughters, uh, uh, grandsons, whatever the situation may be. But so too, I think that we will see uh, the millennials, those people who are perhaps in their 30s, uh, asking their parents about legacy, asking their parents and having those difficult conversations around inheritance, uh, talking amongst themselves in terms of their own generation about um, well, where are we? How would we deal with this situation if one of us were to be uh, incapacitated or, in the worst case, uh, were to be um, were to die from something like COVID? So, risk and, and legacy from a business management standpoint, I think, are, are things to consider when we start to think, for example, about our marketing messages. Um, I'm going to be careful around that, but uh, we've got to think about these things. And uh, as we start to think about some of the um, uh, considerations, some of the changes that we would expect to see going forward, then uh, those two aspects are things which I believe uh, will be important to consider. 
So let's move on, shall we? Now, leadership, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, for those of you that run firms and have teams of people, um, or perhaps you're uh, a leader within your community and you operate as a uh, as a sole trader, but you know, you're still a leader, you're still uh, in your community, you're still running your business. And so uh, all of these things are, are appropriate for us. And I don't think that we can talk about business management without talking about leadership. And in the webinars that I've seen so far, and the, certainly the webinars that we've run, we haven't really uh, talked too much about it. What I can tell you is that, uh, and I'll just dig into my own personal experience here, I've been running businesses, I think I started my first one back in uh, ooh, 1996, and I've been running businesses since then, and recently I've been um, uh, sort of brought in to help transform businesses or perhaps to, to help distress businesses um, sort themselves out and that's been been really difficult at different times um, uh, some very difficult circumstances with shareholders or um, just general business circumstances but all those things that I've been through I um, have found this particular period with COVID to be a, a real test and uh, it's quite challenging, isn't it? Because it is quite different uh, to be ahead of the the mood of your people and to be ensuring that we're uh, making our plans and doing all the right things when everything is just so chaotic, when everything is just so changeable, when our, everything is just so new and different, even though we've got a, a lot of experience in, in this area. So. I, I offer these uh, tips to you, and look, it's it's by no means exhaustive. Uh, leadership is a multifaceted thing, and everyone has their own style. But I'm just talking from my own experience. Hopefully, they are of some value to you. Now, values and vision, I think, are really important to any organisation. And uh, I'm hearing some horrendous stories of uh, organisations that have abandoned uh, values. Um, in, in running this whole COVID situation. In fact, I heard stories about uh, a local organisation that um, made somebody redundant when they were sick in hospital with COVID. Uh, that same organisation was um, made somebody redundant on the day that they had lost uh, their partner from COVID. Absolutely appalling. Now, whether that organisation had any values in the first place is, is uh, questionable, but it is absolutely critical to me that an organisation, uh, in fact, doesn't um, or does embrace their values and their vision and that they don't abandon them simply because of the chaos and simply because of the times. Now, the importance of that is that uh, an organisation will then be remembered and the staff will value all of the things that you're doing when you're being a straight shooter, when you're acting with transparency, and when you're living your values. So the tip from me is to go back, have a look at your values, restate them, be really clear about your vision, and we're gonna talk about purpose uh, a little bit as we go forward. Now, here's one of the toughest things to do, and that is to be positive and confident, because uh, all around us is chaos, and uh, there's a lot of change, and uh, the staff are looking to us to uh, to be positive and to be confident about the future, because uh, they themselves have concerns, and all around them is the uh, the, the, the media, uh, the, the negative messaging, they've probably got people in the friendship group who are uh, out of work and uh, there's a lot of nervousness in and around that. So it's really critical that we are positive and confident that we are the energy in the room and that extends out to our clients as well. So that's not just internally, that's going out to talk to uh, groups of people because uh, as we go through this more challenging time and I'm you know, trying to avoid the word recession because I think we talk ourselves into those, uh, those sorts of uh, mindsets, but uh, as we go through these more challenging economic times, that is going to be all the more important. So the positivity and the confidence are something that I urge you to, uh, to consider. And look, it can be difficult, I do, do understand that. Now, every organization is different. For, for our organization, Ark and Legal, and for the businesses that I've run in the past, I've always tried to be as absolutely transparent as I possibly can be in uh, telling people where we're at. So I share with our team the uh, the reality of um, our, uh, our profitability, our costs, our cash flow, um, uh, where we're at with sales. Obviously, that's very transparent. Everyone is aware of that. 
uh, and things that I'm up to. So um, if I'm talking to uh, different people about different things, I will share as much as I'm able without sacrificing any confidentialities or uh, anything that is uh, perhaps going to be concerning for the staff or shouldn't be disclosed. Uh, I will disclose as, uh, as much as I possibly can and, and be transparent. And I think that you know, that really helps, but particularly with uh, internal staff, that they know that you have a plan, that you're doing things, that you're out there talking to people, and uh, that will give them a great sense of, of comfort. Now I'm going to talk a lot about um, flexibility and agility uh, in, in a little while, but it uh, is um, uh, relating to in terms of staff management. I think obviously there's different flexibility that we need because everyone's working uh, in circumstances where they've got young kids, you know, that the, the workplace structure is broken down. So there does need to be that flexibility there. And the last thing, which is probably the most important thing in here for, for me, is to be really clear about purpose. Now, I'm just going to uh, go off on a tangent just for a moment and say that I ran a football club in New Zealand and the football club um, was uh, ambling along and uh, doing uh, reasonably well, but hadn't won a thing in, in, in 50 something years. And uh, I was lucky enough to get involved in, in that football club. And one of the things that I, that I did together with a group of other people was to be really clear about uh, why the football club existed. So what was it that actually the football club did? And when we realized that in fact, the football club was all about um, being a center for community engagement and uh, unity, that everything then revolved around that. And that club then went on to uh, double its playing numbers, win multiple things, win 10 national titles uh, in, in six years. And I, I look back at that and I say that that was because we got the collective power of purpose with everybody coming together and are working towards the, the same purpose, the same goal. Now, in your organization, and particularly in this time that we're in, where it's chaotic, where it's changeable, um, where there's um, a, a heck of a lot that we don't know, I think it's really critical that you have, it's called a totem pole of purpose, that you have something that is planted in the ground and that everybody knows that that is what the organization is, is about, including your clients, including anybody else who comes into that community and it comes into connection with the business, that you're very, very clear on what your purpose is, but that inside your organization that you are absolutely crystal clear on what your purpose is. Now, let's move on, shall we? Because I'm uh, eating up the time and Sam and, uh, Bib and uh, Bibber are going to run out of time to talk. Now, strategy, I'm just going to whip through this reasonably quickly because I'm sure that the people in the um, in the webinar are familiar uh, and have been thinking a lot about, about strategy, but here's a couple of tips from me. So first thing is don't give up on your strategic objectives simply because we're in this time. There's uh, still an opportunity for us to hit our strategic objectives. It's just the way in which we're going to uh, achieve them is going to be different. Now, uh, we'll need to remap that and, and replan that because, yes, things have changed and uh, that will be a reasonably holistic. It will be about business process, it will be about marketing. Uh, there won't be too many aspects that we won't have covered. But look, you know, we're, we're in this time where actually we're a counter cyclical business and uh, we could expect to be more busy. And I think that we could probably expect to be uh, even busier going, going out from here. But uh, we do need to think about the way in which we're going to achieve those strategic objectives. So that's where your plan comes in. Now, uh, if you had a goal to uh, perhaps hit, I'm going to pull a number out of thin air, 500,000 in uh, in revenue, then it may well be that uh, you can still hit that strategic objective, but you just need to be a bit more realistic about when that's actually going to happen. So look, you know, yes, it's not ideal, but we're in unprecedented times. So if you do need to change the timeframes, we can do that. You know, think about um, just pushing it out. The main thing is you have a plan, you have a goal, and you're not giving up on it and just um, perhaps uh, rolling over and saying, well, no, too hard, I'm not going to do it anymore. Now, there's going to be opportunities. There are opportunities already in the market. So start having a think about what uh, some of those things might be. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. We are starting to see a lot of world writers who uh, were perhaps uh, within a year or two of, um, of retiring start to think about getting out and uh, maybe bringing forward that time frame. So there, there's opportunities there to perhaps acquire wool banks. Um, conversely, if you're a wool writer and you uh, perhaps were 
looking to get out yourself, then uh, maybe there's an opportunity to go and work with a, uh, a larger wool writing practice and to bring your wool bank and to enter into a, um, a revenue share arrangement around that because it is an asset. So there's opportunities there for you to do that as well. Now, if you're a bigger firm and you're, you're well funded, then there's certainly going to be acquisition or merger opportunities. So perhaps have a think about that. Perhaps there's some joint venture opportunities that you could pick up on as well. Now, we mentioned before that things are going to be volatile and they're going to be changeable. And uh, the critical thing from a strategic perspective is that you really do consider your agility and your efficiency. Because if we imagine that we're going to get pressure uh, on price and if we're going to get pressure on um, on revenue, it's going to get harder to, to create the same amount of revenue, but uh, perhaps it's not, we don't know. Um, nonetheless, it's an opportunity to consider how quickly your business can respond. And the shift to remote working is obviously one of those great examples where we know that it's been quite difficult for some organizations to actually uh, move to remote working. And that was a lesson for many about you know, being tethered to, to the desk. So strategically think about that, think about the efficiency. So can you deliver the same amount of work um, but with less staff, or can you deliver an increased volume of work without increasing staff? So increasing revenue, but keeping your costs uh, down. And uh, certainly from a marketing perspective, obviously that's what we do. So do come and talk to us. We've got uh, lots of tools that can help you do that, particularly around not having to, to, to re-key data. And the last thing I'd say strategically is to be very conscious of changing consumer behavior. Now we talked a little bit about that in the, uh, the previous section, but uh, if you think about your strategic plan, then uh, my advice to you would be to be quite agile around that and to be continually talking to people and understanding where they're at, because it's gonna be quite a few mood swings and changes in the way that consumers um, uh, behave. And we'll, we'll expect that that will change in certain groups, perhaps more than others. So be aware of the generational changes and be aware of the impact of uh, economic changes on overall consumer behavior. So be aware of it, but don't, but don't uh, perhaps be um, overly concerned about it. Just bring it into your strategy and uh, have a think about that when it relates to uh, your strategic conversations, when you're measuring uh, where your business is, is at because you do need to start thinking about being agile and changing to meet the, the, the needs and the demands of the market. So that's enough about strategy. Now, a quick look through financial management. As I mentioned earlier on, there is a webinar on this that we ran. So it's on the website. Uh, we interviewed a chartered accountant, uh, she was brilliant. So um, if you're interested in, in some more detail, then please do that. What I would suggest to you though, is that the golden rules here, uh, certainly in this phase and going out, is uh, cash is king. So cash flow is absolutely critical. There's some great tools out there. If you don't have uh, zero, if you're not using the futurely forecasting tool, then uh, I would urge you to, uh, to do that because you need to understand uh, what your cash position is. And uh, for those of you that are perhaps in uh, the unfortunate position of, of burning cash, that you've got a negative cash flow, um, your costs are higher than your revenue, then you really need to work out what your cash burn rate is and uh, what your runway is in terms of how long you've got to run your business before you need to start looking at um, uh, making more drastic decisions. And of course, from a business management phase perspective, you need to think about that in terms of economic cycles when we start thinking about the, um, the end of the furlough plan and uh, what we're going to do at that stage. Be uh, very much in control of your trade debtors, but be very wary of the way in which you go about collecting debts. There's a way to do that. I've had um, different organizations contact me at different times and some of them have been, have been highly aggressive and uh, some of the people who haven't and have just been very understanding but politely inquiring have um, adopted a different approach. So be sympathetic, be understanding and be aware of your costs. Now that's a, a standard thing within any business but uh, particularly now so, uh, at this stage we can uh, look at costs and say, well, okay, is it absolutely essential to run the business? And, and I would further say to you uh, to, to run the measure over it as to whether it is actually creating you the efficiencies that you need uh, and whether there's a more efficient way to, uh, to get value out of uh, some of the, the costs that you have inside your business. So think about it from a value perspective. Also think about it from a cost management perspective. Is it absolutely critical to deliver the service? What you don't want to do is you don't want to cut costs and then find that you've 
um, got a whole lot of intangible costs coming back in because you've become inefficient, you've become unagile. That is not where you want to be as you go forward. So it's a quick flick through. As I say, do have a look at that webinar. It's, um, it's very good. Even if I do say so myself, I didn't talk a lot in it, um, but Jackie did and she was brilliant. Quick look at government help as well. Now, many of you obviously are uh, very familiar with the furlough scheme, so I'm not going to talk about that too much, other than to say to be very aware from a business management standpoint of when that is going to end and uh, how that sits as against the different phases in terms of the um, uh, relaxation and, uh, and, and resumption. Have a think about the Siebel loans. Um, there's 135,000, I think, when we ran the webinar last week um, of, of loans that have been applied for. So uh, you need to be uh, need to be doing that. Um, there's also some innovation grants. That's probably more for businesses that are doing stuff in technology. Have a think about research and development. Um, I know that from an ARCA legal perspective that we obviously develop a lot of software and we do get a, a research and development grant from the government uh, and different organisations can apply for that. And that uh, can make a substantial difference if you are um, uh, able to, to do that. Uh, and look, there's local government support, and I'm not just talking there about the assistance for hospitality businesses and what have you. There's, uh, and that's the, the uh, uh, council taxes. There's actually different programs that are always run from local council as they try to encourage business. So I'd encourage you to have a look at those because there's probably some grants that you could apply for which uh, may well uh, assist you there. And the last point, which we haven't uh, made here in, in terms of the graphic, is to keep a close eye on what's being offered, because I would expect a lot of change to occur and come through in uh, the next little while as the government starts to ramp up its um, activities. Right, and the last slide for me is around marketing. Now we covered a, uh, Pippa Shepard did a, a masterclass in marketing earlier this week. If you weren't in that webinar, I, urge you to go to it, it was absolutely brilliant. And uh, there's a lot in that you can take away for your business in any time, at any place, but have a look at that. Now, look, the key things uh, as your takeaways there is that you've got to be aware that bias have changed. We've mentioned that. You've got to have a think about your product, what are you putting out there, what price are you putting on it, the, um, uh, the people that you're selling to, where are they at? And uh, you've got to think about actually where you're advertising. So where are the eyeballs, where are the people, and how does that fit with your business? And of course, you've got to think about the promotion. And overall, what you need to think about there is be digital, uh, make sure you get your social pieces, but get the messaging right uh, is, the, is the key message there. A couple of examples for you if we move on to the next slide. Ah, oh, there you go. I've chopped out my slides already. That's it from me for meantime. And the, so I'm going to pass across to Pippa Shepherd. Pippa. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, I'm going to be looking at staff management here and I'm going to be covering off a, a few things. So looking at working from home, the technical issues we've got there, the mental health challenges, how we can manage those staff. So what different options have we got and the communications, the furlough and how we engage uh, with both the people that are working, but also the people who are furloughed. So if we look about working from home, now there's people and we need to think about our staff in different scenarios there. So we don't know who we are living in flats, maybe even a studio flat. They've got um, a very small house or they've got children at home. They're trying to do their homeschooling. You know, there might be space limitations, controlling influences in the in the environment that we're not actually aware of. So we need to think about that holistically. The IT technical setup as well, it's not quite like it was in the office. The Wi-Fi might not be as strong. There might be with frustrations with calls, trying to put them through, not knowing if somebody else is already on the call and can take them. One of the big issues though is mental health. Um, this might be people missing interactions, but everybody will be having something that they find a challenge. They may have a very active social life that's just fallen off a cliff. They might have their children at home that are causing uh, different issues. They might be by themselves and very lonely. So add in those health worries, add in the food challenges, add in money worries, add in worries about the future and what's going to happen. There's no end to this lockdown yet. And there might also be grief in that mix too. So if somebody's worried about a friend or a loved one who's ill or has passed away, or even if not directly affected, many people can just be affected by the amount of people dying, the statistics that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
where we might have been okay to start with, you know, the novelty of working at home, the novelty of setting it all up. We were only at the start of the pandemic at the beginning, so the figures weren't as scary. Now we've been locked down for four, five, six weeks even. It becomes more difficult to keep positive. So having that no end date as well to work towards is also harder. So we've put in place a couple of articles that might be worthwhile for you. The first is about working from home and tips from working from home. I'm sure most of you got um, really good setups there now, but it is worth reiterating the methods and also cab cabin fever tips. So if I just go through that um, very quickly. So the working at home, we're talking about adapting your morning routine, zoning your home, make time for physical, mental health, stay connected, embrace technology. Please follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook and you can get um, copies of all of these to help share with your staff. Cabin fever. This is all about mixing it up. You know, we all have the desire now after being in so long to just get in that car, drive to the seaside, take the kids to the park, let them run free, go into the pub, just sitting and shooting the breeze over a pint or a G&T. We're doing the right thing by staying in. You know, we're helping lives, we're helping the NHS, but we all miss that. We miss family, we miss friends, we miss interaction, we miss work, we miss routine. I miss the teachers teaching my kids. But with it extended, how can we all survive for another three weeks, possibly longer? Um, and here we talk in the in the article about challenging your mind, keeping it busy, distracting the mind. Don't look at the hundred different stories that are out there that conspiracy theories. You know, get people to download a good book or you know, get a Netflix and get into a, a new box set there. Challenge the body. I think that's really, really important at the moment. People need to be getting out there, getting their fresh air, getting their exercise. They're allowed a day but still having that routine, get up, have a shower, go for a walk. Now, we're trying to encourage people, use it as your commute, go for, go for a walk as your commute to work in the morning. We need to try and not completely change everything, including body clocks. It will end, this, this pandemic will end, life will become normal again, and we need to be able to transition back. The connections, we do need to keep connecting. So call a friend, get a Zoom call up with family and friends. I've had phone calls with my university mates. We don't normally do that from one year to another, but we've had some big birthdays this year. So it's been great to engage in that rather than getting face to face. It's good to have a laugh, even if it's just how bad you look on the camera. But try and get your staff to avoid the, the negative coping mechanisms like drinking, like staying up all night reading or believing these conspiracy theories and reading more of them um, on the Internet. It's really important that everybody forgives themselves. You know, we're in a really difficult period here. Life's changed. There's nothing wrong in feeling strange, upset and frustrated. And especially if they've got children or they're looking after other people, they do need to look after themselves first, because um, if they don't look after themselves, they won't be able to look after the others. Moving swiftly on, we'll look at staff management. The most important part here is you must see them, not physically, obviously, but if you can get some video conferencing going, please see them, get a real feel, get the visual clues about how they're feeling. We have a stand up in the morning, we have a sit down in the evening, so nine o'clock and half past four, that gets everybody up, gets everybody planned for their day. Team meetings are great, but mix that in with one-to-ones. It's really important. People might not necessarily want to share things on a team chat, um, but they might on a one-to-one. -one. Everybody's got something different that's stressing them out, so please keep that in mind. One of the things we use is rating. So we get the teams to rate themselves between one and 10 every now and again, not obviously every day. One's being feeling really rubbish, two, uh, 10 is feeling absolutely smashing. And we get them to see where they are on the scale and the changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Really, really good. Surveys, you can survey your staff. If you've got a lot of staff out there, that might be something to do. Use something like uh, SurveyMonkey. You can put together a free survey quite easily. If you do need to reduce your staff overheads, think about creative ways of doing that. You, you don't want to lose that expertise that you've been investing in over the years. And it's also better for the business. It's better for the human side as well. So think about different ideas like rotating staff. If you've not got them all working or, or there's not enough work for every day, can you get them working on a Monday and a Wednesday or a Tuesday and Thursday and rotate the staff that are actually working? If you do need to reduce staff overheads, Think again, obviously there's the furlough schemes there, 
but could you get everybody working four days a week and, and taking that one day pay cut rather than making anybody redundant? You know, Martin Lewis has been out there saying that if you have made somebody redundant before the furlough scheme was announced, re-recruit them and get them furloughed. See if you can help them through that. It really isn't a good look to make people redundant now if you can possibly help it. It doesn't look good for your brand, but also for the people that are left behind, it doesn't necessarily um, feel comfortable either. If we move on to communications, Dave mentioned earlier about being honest and transparent. There were a lot of people out there worried about how the company's doing, risk of redundancy, the company closing, maybe getting into financial trouble. If you can be open and honest as you can be, that's great. If you need to cut costs, get them involved. They might be able to identify ways that you can cut non-staff costs there. Multiple brains are better than one. And it will also make them feel part of the solution. Don't forget, um, this is a classic mistake, don't forget to communicate to those on furlough. They might be feeling a little, little, little lost, a little disengaged. Please make them feel comfortable, part of the uh, company still, that they're not forgotten. Really important to engage with all of the staff. You can maybe have an optional furlough staff catch up once a week, so they still feel involved. They might feel more vulnerable than those that are still working. Why didn't you all your normal remit of communications? How can you send out different information to help them in the situation we're in there? Think about nutrition, think about exercise, things like overcoming cabin fever. One of the things that we hope to be announcing is other upcoming webinars, uh, looking at things like mindfulness. So really extending the, don't just talk about the business, extend it out to talk about other circumstances as well. We have quarantines on a Friday, which we use Zoom, we can all see each other, and we have a drink, we have a bit of fun, we have a competition about what backgrounds you can put up or a theme of what backgrounds you can put up on Zoom. Uh, the first one was, you know, what's the first restaurant or pub you're going to as soon as lockdown's finished? Really good, we've got some great ideas of other restaurants to go to too. I've put there, share the load. Communications don't just have to be you. I mentioned John in our first webinar, who's dressing up every day. Well, that's continued, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a minute. But it really lifts the spirit of the team. We share them on social media, so follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn to see what he's wearing today. But ask somebody else in your organisation to be responsible for different elements of the communication. Rotate the chairs of team meetings. Rotate those that come up with a theme for the Zoom backgrounds. Something like quarantine is really good for, for engaging the whole firm. And think about if you're a small firm, that might work for you. If you've got a lot of staff, there may be a, a weekly whole staff briefing. Bring the whole company together, um, not just each team. So I think things like Zoom are really good. You can see the images of stuff. So let me just show you, this is John. Um, so this is John dressing up every day, uh, different outfits, um, and he's kept it going. We've got probably about 22, 23 of these outfits now. So uh, really keeps the spirit of the company going. So I'll leave you with the pictures of John, and now I'll pass over to Sam, who's going to take you some of the legal aspects from this webinar. Sam. Oh, thank you, Heather. Um, now, um, we we'll all have to agree that these are not normal times and uh, client needs are going to be slightly different. So I'd just like to briefly run you the documents that will be most important for your clients at the moment. Uh, so wills are always something that we encourage clients to have, but COVID-19 is an egalitarian virus. No one knows whether they or their family will be affected and people's thoughts are increasingly turning to their own mortality. So getting a will in place gives people peace of mind and um, it ensures they won't be subject to the vagaries of intestacy and that vital matters such as the guardianship of their children will be taken care of. So um, wills probably first and foremost are what everybody thinks of. But thankfully, many more people who get COVID-19 will recover from it than will pass away. So for those who contract the virus, there could, however, be a period of serious incapacitation. Um, we simply don't know enough about how this virus will affect people, so clients do need to be prepared. And to that effect, LPAs are very useful documents to have in place because they enable someone to take care of another person's affairs and LPAs survive loss of capacity. We've done extensive webinars on LPAs, which we can send you for more information. But in brief, LPAs can be made in relation to health and welfare and or property and financial affairs. 
Um, in relation to welfare, um, they only come into effect once they've been registered and once the donor has lost capacity. So these enable a trusted person to make decisions for a donor in respect of their medical treatment and welfare. And as I said, this continues even if the donor loses capacity. For example, if dementia is exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, an LPA in respect of property and financial affairs, again, must be registered with the OPG, but take effect even if the donor has not lost capacity and it stays in effect after the donor loses capacity. This will allow the donor to give a trusted person control of their financial affairs in the event that they are self-isolating or require extensive hospitalisation. So this will allow things like mortgage payments, maintenance payments to children and other everyday expenses to be met seamlessly. And it's particularly important to give consideration uh, to putting an LPA in for clients who have joint accounts. If both are required to be signatories, if one is incapacitated, whether due to COVID-19 or otherwise, the remaining partner may be unable to access the accounts in the absence of proper authorization. Um, the main benefit of an LPA is that it survives loss of capacity, but the major downside is it requires stringent witnessing and a certificate provider and have to be registered with the OPG. And at the best of times, this can be 10 weeks. At the moment, it is completely unclear how long registration is going to take, particularly with the high demand for registrations at the moment. So in the current circumstances, we would suggest that in addition to FPA, clients should also put into place advanced decisions and a general power of attorney, which will give clients immediate peace of mind. These documents don't have to be registered and so have immediate effect. Whilst they don't survive a loss of capacity, they can be put into place to bridge the gap while the registration of an LPA goes through. They also perform a slightly different function to LPAs. Um, we've created um, detailed fact sheets and further webinars on these documents, so please do ask if you want more detail. But in brief, a general power of attorney is only in relation to financial affairs. It can't be in relation to medical care, but it can give another person access to some or all of the donor's accounts, allowing for seamless financial management should that person become incapacitated. And an advanced decision is a set of instructions directly to a person's medical carers, specifying the types of treatment that a person consents to. This is particularly useful in the current climate where an attorney, next of kin, may actually be unable to accompany a person to hospital. In the event that a, a person cannot communicate with doctors in hospital, an advanced decision can impart their wishes directly for them. And it's worth noting here that the ARC and advanced decision allows two witnesses. We believe this is best practice. However, if two are unavailable, then the bare legal requirement is one witness, though ideally that witness should be as independent as possible. Um, the next thing I'd like to look at is signature and signatures and witnessing, um, as this is an area where um, th there is a little bit of difficulty at the moment. That might be an understatement. Um, so, so signatures and witnessing requirements are governed by the Wills Act 1837, and there has been no official indication that the requirements of this le legislation can be deviated from in the face of a pandemic and even with government mandated social distancing. And the Act was formulated in Victorian England um, and it was to protect the vulnerable against fraud by having two independent witnesses to ensure that test dates were given, uh, it had given appropriate testamentary consent and were not subject to um, undue influence. And even though we live in a completely different age where technological advances could allow a much easier process, um, there has been no law change. And so the best advice we can give is to comply with the act if humanly possible, because there is no guarantee that an imperfectly executed will would be upheld. So in short, uh, wills must be in writing, must be signed by the testator or on his behalf and in his presence. Wills must be witnessed by two witnesses, both physically present when the testator signs, and it must appear on the face of a will that the test data wish to give effect to their will by their signature. 
So this is the status quo at the moment, and it is very difficult to comply with under the current circumstances, which requires people to stay two metres apart. The only informal testamentary bequests that have been traditionally recognised in the UK are Donatus Multa Causa. Um, these are deathbed gifts, which can be made outside of a will, and therefore don't require the same formalities. Um, there are three conditions for these to be considered valid. Um, the donor must be immediately contemplated death. And the gift is to take place only when that contemplated death occurs, and it will be revocable to that point. And the donor of the, of the um, asset must actually give dominion of it, which means they have to either hand over the physical asset itself or an item that represents the, that, that asset. For example, giving car keys represent a car. So this could give testators some ability to divest themselves of assets during the current pandemic, but it will still be very difficult for such a deathbed bequest to be made in a hospital situation, um, because if relatives aren't permitted to the bedside, it may be impossible for the communication that's necessary to occur or for the to give the necessary dominion to actually hand over the necessary items. So it, it, it might be interesting now just to have a quick look at a comparison with how other jurisdictions have responded or how they're set up. Um, so just a quick look at a couple of Commonwealth jurisdictions. So um, first, in Queensland, Australia, um, their wills formalities are governed by the Succession Act 1981. And originally, this was much like the Wills Act here. But they changed the law in 2006 to allow less formal documents to be considered a will. And in an extremely uh, uh, case, a draft text message found on a dead man's mobile phone was um, accepted as a legitimate will. It's very hard to imagine such a scenario being contemplated here. Um, but there has to be a middle ground some, somewhere in there. Um, looking at New Zealand next, if we could have the next slide, please, Jess. Thank you. Um, so New Zealand already had a degree of flexibility around what could constitute a will. Government there has um, had a very swift and decisive response to the current pandemic to ensure that people can make wills um, to give them peace of mind at this time. So as in um, the UK, um, they had digital signatures for many documents, but not for wills. And the law was much the same as in the UK. Um, but um, their Wills Act 2007 already granted the courts somewhat more flexibility as to what could constitute a will. Section 15 allowed that informal wills could be declared as valid by a court before probate is granted, as long as the court is satisfied of the testator's intent to create a will. And in 2018, the New Zealand courts were faced with an informal will trying to divest a 2.8 million New Zealand dollar rate. And this was jotted down across a number of documents, including the back of a postcard and on a piece of law firm note paper. But the court found that it did, in fact, constitute a will. All of the bits of paper together were titled as a will, and they were signed and dated with the same date. So read together, they did appear to express testamentary intent and were upheld as a will. So the courts already did have some flexibility in a way that the courts here probably do not. Um, although this hasn't been tested under the current pandemic crisis, and it may be exceptional times could potentially give rise to additional tension, but nobody to be that first test case. So back, back to New Zealand, um, despite there being potential judicial flexibility, um, the New Zealand rushed two immediate modification orders, which amend requirements in relation to the presence of witnesses in administering oaths and witnessing wills. So these allow for audio visual declarations, um, which can be used for wills as an alternative to being in the physical presence of a person. The will maker can direct someone else to sign on behalf via an audio visual link, and two witnesses can sign two different copies of the will from two different pages, as long as this is in view of the testator and each other via an audio visual link, 
and as long as they have both witnessed a status signing via that digital link. So in this way, the government's made an immediate and practical decision to respond to the need for remote signing when social distancing is being enforced. So if we can move on to the situation in the UK um, in relation to law reform. So on the next slide, please, Jess. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, the Electronic Communications Act allows for digital signatures for a number of documents. This specifically excludes wills. Um, and in 2017, the Law Commission had undertaken a, a consultation on modernising the law relating to the execution of wills, which um, including electronic wills, formal wills and digital signatures. But unfortunately, this has been put on pause. And the Justice has um, said that the relaxation of the rules has to be balanced. Um, the need to protect vulnerable people needs to be worked against the need for a modern practical uh, step. Uh, other professional bodies have been in talks with the Ministry of Justice and we encourage all petitioners to take them now to write to their MP and their industries to, allow, to add to the debate around the need for change in the signal requirements for work and to encourage change and change quickly. The demand was there but it's been made by the need for social distancing. Other countries have modernised or taken emergency measures to enable people to make effective wills, um, to give people peace of mind. It really is time that the UK should follow it as well. So given other countries have had or have through pragmatic witnessing solutions, there are a number of options available to the government here. Um, that informal will should be allowed, which could be court approved before probate is granted that electronic signatures should be allowed, um, audio-visual witnessing could be a solution, or perhaps even um, a, a solution around the privilege wills that are allowed to servicemen on active duty um, because they could potentially be in a situation um, the formalities of a will is um, dispensed with. And this is uh, essentially an analogous situation here at the moment. Um, so there has never been a stronger argument for digital signatures or audiovisual witnessing in the current pandemic. But just to reiterate, the situation we find ourselves in is that best practice is to continue to follow the requirements of the 1837 Act. This means two independent witnesses have to be physically in the presence of the data when he signs. So I'll just move on now looking at the practicalities of that. Um, at the moment, it is sometimes necessary to weigh best practice against the art of the possible. And uh, we've always said ideally it should not be related to the test data, should not live in the household, and should be as independent as possible. The Wills Act is actually quiet as to who should be a witness to a will as long as the beneficiary. So in these circumstances it may be necessary to take the view that any witness is better than witness and a will can always be executed once restrictions are lifted with more independent witnesses. Again it, it's weighing best practice against what is actionable. So finding witnesses has required practitioners to employ a degree of inventiveness when it protects protect status um, and maintaining social distance. So um, just a, a brief look at some of the practical suggestions we've heard. So um, lawyers can still go to witness wills as long as they maintain a distance. But if they take someone with them in household and witness, they can go together. So this could be a spouse or an adult child, perhaps, if they're furloughed or have flexible working conditions. Witnesses have signed documents in the safety of their own car while watching a testator sign the will on his bonnet. They pass the, the will through the window, so they've got a, a physical glass barrier protecting all the parties. Um, witnesses can stand outside and watch the testator sign on the window ledge and then be passed the document through the mailbox to sign on the other side of the window with the testator watching. Uh, Neighbours can witness a will across the fence. Um, and um, whilst there's absolutely no requirement 
that the um, witness has to be a solicitor or, or qualified in any way. They can be delivery drivers, corner shop owners, tradespeople. So the difficulty here is getting two witnesses to the property at the same time. But um, if they find themselves in that situation and people are prepared to act as witnesses, um, that they, they should um, take that opportunity if they can. Um, so, in addition to doctors and nurses, um, it appears that the NHS is advising doctors and nurses not to act as witnesses to wills. Um, this is understandable because of their enormously high workload at present, um, but also to reduce the risk of the virus being into hospitals on documents and, and by people bringing them in. Um, so, when someone is in a hospital situation, it could be very difficult indeed to affect the signing of um, and so it's really, really important to contact clients to make sure that they have executed outs or that they've updated wills if necessary. Don't leave it too late because it can be very, very difficult once a, a person is admitted to hospital. Um, so if that is the situation the practitioner is faced with, they will have to make a judgment call as to whether it is better to have an imperfect signature, such as via a video, the no call. And as stated earlier, it is impossible to tell at this stage how dramatic courts be in finding valid, perfectly executed wills which have had to have been completed in a hurry or for death. Um, so if a practitioner is found finding himself in such decision, any rules they can keep of their involvement with the test data and of the instructions that they are given can only be of benefit. So um, similarly, keep be absolutely vital in taking instructions via video link and establishing mental capacity in face-to-face -face situations where contact is not possible. Um, this is something we would like to run a future webinar on, so I, I won't go into this here because we are running short of time. But if there are things you'd like us to cover or experiences you'd like to share in this regard, please do get in touch because we would really like to facilitate the sharing of experience in the industry for the collective. So um, we, we have run a little bit over, so I will briefly hand back to Dave. Hello again, everybody. Well, look, uh, as Sam was saying, we are running short on time, but thank you to both Pippa and to Sam for uh, your input to that. That was, uh, that was superb. Well, look, hopefully the, you have all got something out of that. What I would say to you in summary is, uh, to, to be positive. There's definitely opportunities out there. Uh, be calm to uh, certainly involve your staff and to look for the ways in which you can seek financial help. And to think about legacy. Think about the legacy in terms of your clients and the way that they interpret that and their legacy, but also think about your personal legacy. Also think uh, about the legacy of the firm that you run or that you work for during this time because uh, it is a special and unique time that we're in and uh, our legacy is within our control so we can certainly uh, consider that as we start to think about our strategic planning and our uh, mental approach. Now for those of you that know me and have been in, in webinars with me uh, in, in the past, you'll know that I can't do a webinar possibly without having a Winston Churchill quote, so I've very quickly got a couple of uh, appropriate quotes I think, and one of them was uh, around the uh, economic system in Hitler's Germany. So I thought that was reasonably appropriate as we kind of look back at other times. The unforgivable sin of Hitler's Germany was to develop a new economic system by which the international bankers were deprived of their profits. It is a mistake to look too far ahead. Only one link in the chain of destiny can be handled at a time. And I shall leave you on that particular note because when all around us is chaos, when all around us is uh, is uh, uh, moving and changing, and we're not quite sure of the circumstances, I think that's quite an appropriate point. The last thing from me is to look at some of the, the uh, webinars that we have done, financial management, that's there on our website. So just look at uh, www.archelegal and go through the navigation, it's, it's there on the site. Uh, you might also want to consider online will services and why you'd uh, think about offering one. So that's basically the business case, particularly during COVID-19, but also beyond. 
uh, the original business continuity case that's quite different to this webinar uh, and we explore a whole lot of very valuable stuff in there that's actually been viewed um, uh, well uh, more than 100 times I think already um, plus the, the number of people that we had actually in that webinar and then Pippa gave an absolute masterclass on Tuesday around marketing during COVID-19. Now we're determined to keep trying to assist you to try and help uh, in, in sharing our experience and in sharing the experience of the collective so uh, please feel free to get in touch with us through our support uh, mechanisms and in the uh, feedback loop that we're going to send you if you could please uh, involve yourself in that we'd uh, be, be very grateful to hear your feedback. Uh, other than that, look, uh, stay well, stay positive, stay happy, and uh, we look forward to your attendance and other webinars. Good morning.